Fala Bedat. You are listening to the Women Power Podcast, a subsidiary platform to the Women Power Summit, the largest event in MENA, with the aim of empowering women and helping them achieve their absolute highest potential. Each week on the Women Power Podcast, you will hear honest, vulnerable, authentic, real conversations from inspiring women. These women will share their experiences and stories into what it takes to build a successful business and career. The podcast will share insight and inspiration and hopefully inspire action and lead change. Side note, even though we are all at home, we wanted to bring you valuable content. So this episode of the podcast is brought to you over Zoom. Please bear with the sound quality. Thank you. Since she founded Niche Arabia in 2011, Maryam Najib Masalli has become a leading voice for Saudi Arabia in the luxury consulting field. After starting her career as a journalist, Maryam is now an established name in the fashion industry. Her company, Niche, specializes in luxury marketing, and she also conceived and curated the book Under the Abaya, which features street style images submitted by Saudi Arabian women. Only a week after posting about the book, she received over a thousand submissions. Masali was the only Arab professional invited to the celebration of Design Gala in 2015, hosted by the former First Lady of the United States, Michelle Obama. Welcome, Maryam. So I wanted to ask you, how are you doing during COVID? Um, have you found this time? Because you're always on the go, on the go, on the go. You're doing yeah. so much. You're, you know, full speed ahead. Have you slowed down and have you felt anxious at all? I feel like my answer is, of course, I've slowed down. But if you ask my husband, he's like, not at all. And I think, you know, it's really funny because for me, like you said, I'm used to traveling and, you know, always like going to meetings and and having that interaction with clients and, and creatives. And so that's definitely slowed down. But I feel like the moment COVID hit, it was like, OK, how can we pivot? Like, you know, how can we continue to be like that digital frontier? And so for me and my team, it was actually overdrive when COVID hit. And it was more like, OK, how do we stay relevant? And I think you know, that's kind of the entrepreneurial gene kicking in where it's like, okay, let's keep going. Like nothing's going to stop us. I mean, you have obstacles and it's like, how do you kind of, you know, again, pivot from there. But I, I have to tell you just recently, I think, you know, going into month four, I was realizing like, it's, it's definitely affecting me mentally. I definitely feel that I don't know how to shut off. That's something that's very new. I mean, my husband would say, again, it's not new to him that, you know, he sees me being a workaholic, but I mean, in the sense of like, I'm doing everything in the same area. So my work life, my home life are all kind of just, you know, fused together. And so you don't know when to shut off. You don't know when to put down the phone, when to put down the, you know, close the Zoom and that kind of thing. And, and so I feel like that was very, I mean, that still is very difficult. It's not over yet where I'm still trying to find that balance between saying, okay, now it's 6 p.m. I got to stop, you know, and, and, and like now focus on home. It's kind of like now I think as women, we try to do all the things together. It's really hard to compartmentalize right now when, you know, you're stuck in one, one area. What was the worst day you've had in COVID? Did you have like a breakdown? Did you cry? Were you like claustrophobic? Because I mean, cause you guys were on lockdown in Saudi for a while. Yeah, we're in proper lockdown. I, you know, it's, I mean, I cried about maybe not going for summer. You know, so I'm very quite elitist there. But no, I mean, I don't think, look, when I say like, it's emotionally, it's that I feel like there were waves of just kind of uncertainty and, you know, you think things are getting better and then all of a sudden there's another kind of, you know, um, what do you call it, uh, outbreak again. And then you're like, okay, no. And I mean, even now we're talking about things opening up in September for us to travel. And now they're saying, well, we might actually have to wait till J- January. I mean, God knows how things are, are going to go with this thing. So I think for me, it's it's more like a like a depression of like restlessness and hopelessness that comes in where I just kind of feel like I don't, I'm uncertain, you know, because things are uncertain around me. It's very hard. And one of the things that I find actually found helpful was now focusing on the things that I can control. So this whole thing of like, I'm going back to my personal trainer, I'm trying to eat healthy. So if I can't control the things that are happening outside of me, at least I can control the things that are happening internally. And so I'm really trying to focus on that, you know, reading. One of the things I'm really trying to do is, uh, you know, improve my Arabic, which I've had a horrible start with. <laughs> and, and, and just trying to like, you know, use this time, you know, they say like that self-care, that self-love. Easier said than done, for sure. You know, it's not just a hashtag. To really apply it seems a lot more difficult. But, I mean, for me, that's kind of my main focus now is like, okay, you know, work is there. I have my, my team around, you know, to support me and everything. But I also need to take a break and, and focus on me. And I think a lot of times we forget that about ourselves. You know, we're always on the go. Like you just said, working. We have our kids. We have our husbands. That's, you know, I always say that's my, you know, my second child is my husband. <laughs> And, you know, from there, it's easy to forget ourselves. Has your Arabic affected you getting business or, or 
do you get made fun of sometimes by clients? Like, why don't you speak any Arabic and they judge you? And Well, funny enough, actually, in the beginning of my career, it actually helped. I think, you know, because Anish started out, you know, where we were working with international brands and trying to get them to come, you know, further into the Saudi market. So whether it was through activations or campaigns, and I think having, you know, a Western Kogo accent actually helped them because, you know, it was an unknown territory. And for them to hear someone that sounds like them actually helped me get that business. I think, in ter- like, locally, what it's done, it's hindered me in terms of doing, let's say, more TV interviews or getting more um, exposure. But I don't, I, I mean, I think, you know, Saudi people speak English. And, you know, you can see that with the following and the engagement, especially in an industry like fashion, where a lot of the people, you know, the terminology isn't there in Arabic anyway. So we do see people speaking, you know, or flipping back and forth to English. So for me, it didn't hinder me that much. I think in the beginning of my career, it actually helped me. But now that I'm, now that I'm focusing more on you know uh, being doing local initiatives and local activities, I do see that as a, as an obstacle, um, especially in terms of media. But it just means we have to fight harder, you know, I guess, to get that exposure. So you have incredible work ethic. I mean, since I've met you, I think we hung out a few times when I was in yeah. in, in, in Saudi and. You're like always on the go. You're always on your phone and you're always like talking and thinking and doing so much. And where does your work ethic come from? And and what was your first job? So, I mean, my work ethic, definitely, I have to attribute that to my parents. You know, I have hardworking parents. You know, I remember as a kid seeing my mom, you know, wearing this uh, Chanel jacket, tweed jacket and saying, mommy, I want this. And her saying, well, when you work hard and you can afford it, then you'll get one. And, you know, that stuck with me. And that was actually one of the first purchases I had when I got my first uh, annual contract is I went and bought my little black jacket. You know, it was kind of like this item that, you know, was this benchmark for me. Um, so I definitely attribute it to, to my mom and dad, you know, telling me that you got to work for, for what you want, no matter what you have, you know, already. And my first job, I mean, I've, I've always been an entrepreneur. I, I remember as a kid, like I actually got in trouble with the principal at my elementary school because I was selling um, fans. I, I went to the butted with my dad. You know, those two real fans that are just like the blades, you know, with the battery, single battery. So I bought 50 of them. I had 100 reels. I took 100 reels from my dad, bought 50 of those fans, took out the battery, then went to school, sold the fans for two reels because everyone knew market price, but then sold the battery for one reel. So in order to use it, they had to pay me that extra reel. And so I made 50 reels in one day. And, you know, I remember going back home and giving an envelope to my dad with all these ones. And he's like, what is this? I was like, that's the hundred reels that I, I borrowed you and I, you know, that I got from you. And, uh, and then my dad getting a call the next day from the principal saying, your daughter's not allowed to sell stuff. <laughs> like, what is she doing? And this has kind of been a theme. My She's mom a hustler. Like, you were always, yeah, she was like, you were always doing this kind of stuff. Actually, today, my cousin just called me. She sent me a picture of some friendship bracelets because when we were kids, I made her and her little sister make these friendship bracelets and then we would sell them. And then with the money, we'd buy candy and then we'd play Uno cards and bet with the, with the candy. And then I'd win all the candy back. So then I would end up getting all the candy. She was like, you're such a brat. <laughs> She's like, you still are, you know? So, I mean, I think it's always kind of been in my gene in terms of, you know, always trying to, to do things. And then, I mean, I, and I think that's also really helped me now as an adult because it's always been like, okay, that idea doesn't work. There's another idea. You don't just stop. And I think, you know, that's kind of one of the, I would say, you know, qualities of an entrepreneur is that they know how to basically, again, pivot. I keep using that word, but pivot from one thing to the next. You know, if something doesn't work, it doesn't mean you give up. You see, okay, what worked from there and what didn't and learn from those failures and, you know, the things that did work and then apply it to the next project. So I think, you know, I've, I've always had that since I was a little kid. Why did you choose fashion and publishing to kind of kickstart your career or to get started? Yeah. Well, that's a really interesting question because a lot of my friends from my youth, you know, are just like fashion. We don't see it (laughs) because I was definitely never into it. I think for me, it's always been about creativity. So, you know, I appreciate art. I appreciate interior design, architecture. Um, Fashion was it was something that happened kind of more with niche. I mean, yes, I wrote about it, but I was writing about all the creatives in Saudi. You know, when I started with Arab News, there wasn't a section like, you know, the life and style section. That was something I, I started with another editor. Um, and what we were, what we saw was that people were, well, sorry, the media was just kind of regurgitating the same things that we were seeing in the West. It was like everything from the wire. And I was like, how come we're not creating our own local content? And there was so much creativity. You know, Saudi is a young country and, and you know, in the seventies, all of our parents went to go, you know, create the infrastructure, quote unquote, of Saudi. It was like, you're an architecture, you're business development, you're doing stuff to, again, build the country. Whereas the next generation, I felt, had more freedom in terms of doing more creative fields because of the fact that that was already established. So then you had the chefs, you had the architects, you had, you know, the writers. And to me, I wanted to highlight that. 
And then it was just a natural progression where I started kind of focusing on fashion. You know, for me, it's not so much like I'm, I'm not a stylist. I'm not, you know, a fashionista. But I do appreciate the business of fashion. And I do appreciate the fact that fashion, just like film, just like art, really tells you about a society, especially at that point. I mean, look at the abaya, for example, how that's just, you know, changed over the past, you know, 20 years. We went from all black abayas to inserting color to then having these like sporty abayas, you know, and then you know, it's kind of like the power suit in the 80s that happened in America where all of a sudden women were in the workforce. So then we had the, this, you know, female power suit. I see the same thing happening with the abaya. We're, we're seeing the abaya reflect more of our diverse lifestyle, you know, and, and the women now and inside, we're very versatile, you know, we're, we're out doing things, we're active, you know, whereas before it was kind of more of this ornamentation of the abaya, it was very luxe and heavy because it was more like, oh, ladies who lunch. But now we're seeing the fashion evolve with us. I think that's super interesting. I think that's probably what got me, you know, really into fashion was seeing how that reflected these changes that were happening in our society. So can you tell me how many publications you worked on before you moved to create your own firm? So, I mean, I got out of college. I was working in a branding agency, um, and that's where I got recruited to, to be in the magazine because I was doing a lot of the content development for websites and stuff with, for, for some of these designers and brands. And, um, and the magazine recruited me, Design Magazine. I worked there. I was editor-in-chief uh, for about a year, and then Arab News uh, poached me. And I started uh, there, and while I was actually poached as the web editor for Arab News, they were going to launch a new website, they were trying to go digital, they thought, oh, let's have some young blood to kind of, you know, guide us. But when I was there, I just, you know, again, going back to that story about seeing that the content was, you know, this post 9-11, very much, you know, what we were seeing in the West. Again, I'm I'm a go-getter. I saw that I had a a few extra minutes, and I was like, let me do, like, let me present this uh, concept. And so me and this other editor, uh, you know, approached to Khaled Al-Maina, the editor-in-chief at the time, and he was like, yeah, go for it. If you guys can do it, do it. And we did, and it became super successful. We were actually stealing advertising revenue from our sister publications, which weren't so happy at the time. But, I mean, it was great. And it really opened the doors. And, I mean, I have to tell you, I mean, I was in my early 20s, and I was getting emails from 16-year-olds saying, thank you so much for talking about, you know, uh, food photography. We never thought that that could be an industry. I mean, it was really just opening people's eyes to the various um, industries within the creative realm. And I thought that was super interesting because, you know, Saudis in general, I think Khalijis in general, Arabs, we are very creative. Um, we, you know, we, were, we grew up in a very conservative environment. And so I think that forces us to think outside the box a lot of times. And because of that, I feel like that creativity just comes supernaturally to us. Um, and, I, and I was really, you know, honored and happy to be able to, to cover that. And then, you know, while I was working at the newspaper, you know, doing all of this, going to fashion weeks, meeting international designers... I realized I was, you know, basically consulting, telling them how to get media coverage, how to do trunk shows, what kind of VIPs to connect with. Um, And then I was like, why am I not monetizing on this? And then, you know, I went to my, you know, I flew back from New York Fashion Week, sat at my my cubicle, sent my letter of resignation. And then, you know, a few months later, my dad was like, why are you home all the time? And I was like, oh, by the way, I quit. And here's my registration, Baba. (laughs) Like, I need you to register. And he was like, what? You didn't even consult with us. And I was like, because I didn't want you to talk me out of it. I knew it was going to be a gamble. I was leaving a very nice, high-profile job that got me a lot of exposure, a lot of connections. But I felt like I really wanted to make a difference. I really wanted not just to write about it, but to actually do it. And I think that's where kind of niche falls into, you know, me talking about things and then where I can actually do them. Um, And the same thing now with my social media. You know, one of the things that I keep telling people, it's not just about calling out people or, you know, giving them criticism. But it's also about giving them solutions, educating them. And I think that's really key and that's really important. You know, I I don't don't like this whole kind of mentality now of where we're just calling out people and, you know, Xing them. I think that that doesn't take us, you know, get us anywhere. We need to be able to be open minded and to educate them. Were you a good employee? Would you say that you were, were you a bit rebellious? Were you on time? Were you disciplined or were you kind of all over the place, but you would get the work done? Definitely very disciplined. No, I and I laugh because I, I don't think I am anymore. <laughs> I don't know. But I always tell my team, I was like, you guys know how much I used to work? Like, I never slept. And I mean, that's one of the things that I try to instill in my team is that your name is on it. Whether or not it's on the actual project, you know, or it's under the niche umbrella, you need to be proud of what you come out, what you put out in this world. And I think that's really key. That's something that I was taught at a very young age. And, you know, and that kind of has stuck with me throughout my career where, you know, you, you need to, like, I would sacrifice everything, and you know, for that project to come out the way that I think it should come out. You know, I don't do anything, you know, half-ass. And I think that's something that, 
again, I actually came from those days at working at a newspaper because if I didn't hand in, you know, that article, that means there was a blank spot in the paper. There was no plan B. <laughs> we had to do it. So I think, you know, as an employee, I would like to say that I was good. I definitely wasn't easy. I definitely had a lot of ideas, um, which is also something that I try to encourage with my team now. You know, there's no, I, you know, th th what's that saying? There's no, um, there's no stupid idea or a stupid question. So I always try to encourage them to, to you know, to collaborate and, and give input. The only thing I will say is that research before you do that. It's not just about, you know, just saying anything. It should have some backing. You should have some research behind it. How was your relationship like with your parents? So obviously you, you had a good laugh with your dad about resigning and not letting him know. But a lot of the Saudi women that we meet talk about the challenges they face with their parents. You know, did they get the right support? Uh, you know, they can come from a family who's yeah. very conservative. Did you have any of these issues or challenges or was it smooth sailing? So I don't know if you know this, but just recently, the our Saudi Arabia announced that women over the age of 21 can, can live alone. So we're getting these, these rights. And talking about how I've seen these stories from other women, I was fortunate enough where my dad treated me just like my brothers, like, and maybe to the point where I became, you know, a tomboy. I, you know, I kind of, I mean, I remember one time telling my dad, I was like, I'm going to go and become the first female ambassador for Saudi. And he was like, of course you are. And I didn't realize, well, not only am I not, you know, a male, I'm not, not also a prince, you know, I'm not, I'm not from the royal family where usually these roles are, are given to or, you know, anything. So it was really funny that my dad just never told me no. I mean, and my mom can argue that there was pros and cons to that, you know, as a kid, but I definitely got my way. But I think him always saying, yes, you know, you could do it if you want to showed me that there's like endless you know, possibilities. And I like that. I like the fact that you can do anything if you strive. I know that sounds really idealistic, but having that kind of support as a kid, I think really affects you as an adult. And so I definitely have to kind of attribute that to my father. And whereas my mom was kind of more the, the authoritative uh, figure, the, the disciplinary and disciplinarian who kind of made me at least focus that energy. So I was all over the place, but I had, I think, a good balance with my parents in terms of one kind of giving me that freedom and the other one saying, OK, now focus it. Was your mother coming from a different background living in Saudi? Did it affect you at all? And how was the synergy between your parents? Sure. I mean, like my parents are divorced, actually, but they're, they're still very close friends. But no, I think, I mean, they're a great power couple for sure. And they, you know, they raised us, they co-parented us for sure, um, even though they got divorced when I was about 10 years old. Um, the fact that my mom is actually originally from, uh, well, for, she's from California, uh, Spain originally. She is very conservative. She's probably more conservative than my father. And, you know, being a Latina Catholic, you know, now converted to Islam, she already had those kind of values and that that strict <laughs> that strictness i always say you know where she would basically be like you know you need to be home at this time i need to know where you are um you know you don't have a boyfriend i mean it wasn't like oh because my mom's american all of a sudden like you know I'm, I'm western and that was actually kind of hard growing up where i think in my and i would say boarding because i went to boarding school in switzerland for high school where i didn't know whether i was arab or if i was american and i definitely knew i was way too conservative to be you know your typical american but then i was you know too liberal um, to be your typical saudi so it was really interesting for me to try to find my ground and what i realized growing up is that this third culture kid that is something that and there's a lot of us and you know and, and especially from saudi as well you know as i told you you know especially jeddah it's a melting pot of all these nationalities and I think that, you know, that has allowed me to be more open about culture and, again, also wanting to learn more about things, you know, because I know how difficult it was for me. So I feel like now when I approach someone, I try not to have those stereotypes in my mind or, you know, those judgments, those pre, you know, the prejudgments. So I think in a way it actually helped me. Yes, it was a struggle in the, you know, as a youth, but I think as an adult, it really kind of opened my eyes to, to tell me, you know, you don't know everyone's story. You don't know where they come from. I mean, because you're not old enough to kind of comprehend what's happening. And was that easy for you? Who did you choose to live with? So my mom stayed in Saudi and we, we lived between my mom and my dad. As I said, they co-parented us. So it was, it was actually an amicable divorce, which was nice. I mean, it definitely did affect me because I felt like I grew up a lot faster because I was also like the middle person between them a lot of times, which they tell you never do when you get divorced, you know, but I mean, that's what they did. They trusted me. They're like, oh, tell your dad this or your mom, tell your mom that. And and it, it, like I said, it just kind of made me grow up faster because I just realized, okay, things aren't, you know, that cookie cutter perfect, which is fine. But this new normal was still okay. You know, I always joke, like we were the original modern family, you know, my step siblings, my, my dad, I mean, my, my dad's friend married my mom. 
my my dad married another a woman that my mom knew also you know what I mean so it was a kind of very like modern family in that way but I mean I think it was also healthy it wasn't you know alhamdulillah I was very fortunate not to have you know this traumatic um, childhood but it also was something that required that you know I was very self-aware of what was going on around me 10 years old you're about to become a teenager were you just resentful of them or just angry no actually my like I now I remember this I remember my mom sitting us down and telling me hey we're you know we're we're gonna be separating and me saying okay good like I was like excuse me and she was like you know I just want you kids to know it's not your fault I was like of course it's not my fault you know it's like I, I had a mouth even back then but I mean I just I think at that time you know again because I was around them so much you know I knew that things weren't working out and you know at that age you know being 10 I was 10 going on 16 I thought I knew everything and it for me it was like okay at least the, I, you know, I don't have to deal with them not being happy and I can focus on me or they can focus on me, actually. So, you know, I didn't, the anger didn't hit. I mean, I would tell you the one traumatic thing that happened in my life that I think I have anger regarding is that my older brother, Larry, passed away um, in 2001. And I didn't really deal with that well. You know, I, we kind of put it under the rug like, you know, it's God's plan and, you know, things happen for a reason. And it wasn't until, I think, college where I realized, no, I'm actually angry about this. This actually bothers me that this happened. You know, he, he left four beautiful daughters. And um, I, I think, you know, that was something that was traumatic in my life that has really affected me as a person, knowing that, you know, n- you know every day is a blessing. It, it really does kind of hit home when it, when it, again, it hits that close to home and it's your brother. If you don't want me asking, how did he pass? It was a car accident. He was uh, in the U.S. Army, and he, the person driving, they were doing um, a routine um, training, and she was driving a truck, and she basically drew, drove it off a cliff. So it was a, yeah, it was a kind of uh, like... And he was with other people in the car as well? It was him car. and the driver and one other person. The other two people survived. I mean, it was, they were in ICU. It was a, a battle for them, uh, but he was the only one that passed away immediately. And his, his eldest daughter was, I want to say... She was seven, seven or nine, and the youngest was six months old. And I was very close to my brother. He's 13 years older than me. Um, and I mean, he was my everything, uh, you know, because I was the youngest and he's the eldest. So, he, you know, we had that cute relationship where like he just doted on me and he had, you know, he was very outspoken. He's the one that introduced me to Marilyn Manson. And I used to love that album that made me want to be a writer because I loved the writing. Yeah, I mean, I was definitely, I looked up to him a lot. And I even went to boarding school in Switzerland to be next to him because he was stationed in Vicenza, Italy. And the year that I, you know, got my scholarship and I was going to Switzerland, um, he died that April. So I did, I, mean, I went to school and he wasn't there. So again, like I said, like, I, you know, but I, I kind of kept going. It was like, no, it's okay. And then it wasn't until later that I, I allowed myself, I think, to be angry, to feel those emotions. How did you heal from that experience? I, you know, I think it was like focusing on... The, you know, the life that he left, like his daughters, his wife, and continuing that relationship. Um, you know, his eldest just got married this March in a Zoom uh, COVID wedding, like we did it over Zoom. Um, and, you know, just uh, remembering him. And I think, you know, also like, as you get older, I mean, I have, you know, I got married, I have my kids. So, you know, that that those holes that were left, I think got filled with, with my life and my, my future, so that was good. Are you interested in developing your own podcast or your own show? We want to help you make that happen. We can assist you with branding, conceptualizing the concept and theme, writing your intro and shooting it, editing your podcast episodes, developing a podcast schedule and theme, and creating social media content for your listeners and followers. We want you to have your own platform and space to express your point of view. Contact us on obinehill.com or DM us on Instagram and we'll be here to support you. So I want to segue into what you just said about your son and, and just obviously getting married and, and finding your partner. So did you ever think you were going to get married? And I, I'm saying that because I just feel you're so career driven. Was that on the table one day or I don't have time for this right now? And how did you meet your husband? It's funny you say that because so many people couldn't believe I got married. When I announced my engagement, I well, it was on April Fool's and everyone thought it was an April Fool's joke. And I was like, this is either the most like elaborate, you know, hoax ever because there was flowers, there was his family, you know, like, I mean, but people were just like, no way you're getting married. And it's funny because I never thought that I would not get married. I saw that people thought that about me. 
But I always thought, yes, I will. It's about the kids thing I wasn't sure about, you know. And I mean, alhamdulillah, I'm really happy that I have my son. And inshallah, I want to have one more. And then the factory is closed. But the kids thing was the thing that I thought might take away from my career, but not marriage. Um, I always thought of myself as marrying someone and being this like, you know, super power couple. And I have to say, like my husband right now is that support system. And we also work together. He, you know, we work together on our big government projects. So we, we partner up and I mean, that's an interesting dynamic too now is like working with your husband. Now that COVID happened, we are not working together. That is a bit too much. <laughs> we took a little pause, but no, I mean, I thought I would get married. I didn't have any idea to who, and I did have a timeline. I said, I want to get married by the time I'm 30. And so everyone jokes that my wedding was September 16th and my birthday was, you know, is September 23rd. So I made it just by a week. Uh, but just to make my timeline, you know, uh, because I'm, I'm hardcore like that. Because so we're, yeah, de- we're on deadline, man. We're on yeah, deadline. Yeah, deadline. Exactly. Then I told myself, okay, now 32, baby. Okay. That's one. Like, you have no choice in any of this. How did you guys I, meet? So I've known him since eighth grade. Uh, my, my, my husband went to the American school with me here in Saudi. And then I went to boarding school, as I said, in Switzerland. And then came back. We've, we've always just, you know, been friends. And then even after college, we just started hanging out again. And, you know, like... Like I always tell people, it's really that I open myself up to, to like getting married. I think, you know, we actually as women have to put that in our minds because it's so easy for us to shut other you know aspects of our lives when we're focusing on our career. And so for me at that time, I think it was like 28 or 27. I was like, this is the time where now I need to be serious if I'm going to meet my deadline and get married at 30. So it was just, you know kind of like that where I, I saw that he was very protective asking me where I'm going and I was like what, you know what is this he's just my friend not my boyfriend and I was like but I kind of like it and then you know and then one thing led to another and we literally got um married a year from the date that we we were you know started being together so I love that you talk about it like it's a deadline because I'm quite I'm quite target oriented as well and I knew I, I wanted to get married and have my baby I thought I would do it a little bit earlier but I was not on deadline but it was like okay I need to get focused and like really invest my time in that relationship and kind of see it through but, that, but that's what I mean I think exactly what you're saying I mean it's not so much like okay I have to do it, but it's that idea of opening yourself up. And I actually got that advice from another female, Mona Basuleiman, who was the one that actually told me that because she's a very, you know, career driven woman in Saudi. She works in media. And she said, Miriam, you know, one of the things as us women is that we tend to neglect the other side of, of you know, of ourselves, that, that personal life when you're so career driven. She's like, don't let that happen to you. And I really, that really stuck with me. And it's something, that, you know, to, in order to succeed, I think, you know, in whatever you're doing, you need to be a whole person. And I think, you know, that means not neglecting any other aspect of your life, you know, whether that's you being single or married or whatever, but it's still about you. Um, and so, you know, I made that conscious decision that, that I, you know, I wanted to open up myself for, for a family. Your husband looks really rooted and calm and introverted in comparison to you. Is that true? Yeah. And, and how is your dynamic together? He is a Pisces. He is quiet but deadly. You know, they explode. You know, no. I think you know, Muhammad. He, you know, what's interesting is he grounds me in terms of making me stop and rethink, especially when it comes to social media. He, him, and my grandma are my two kind of benchmarks for censorship. I, I tend, I try not to swear because I think my grandma's gonna, you know, look at it. And then I try not to be controversial because I, they, my, my husband will come and be like, okay, calm down, you know. And I think that's kind of been the hardest thing. For me as a person that has a social media personality and a business is that people always like, how can you critique this brand? And then you work with them. And I was like, well, it's because I critique them that I'm working with them. Because again, I think that when I do call out people, I don't just call them out like, uh uh-huh, you know, you did that wrong. It's more like, guys, you did this, which I don't think is the right strategy. This is a proper strategy. And then they call me and they're like, okay, tell us what you can do. And, you know, that's kind of how I fed things from my social media to niche, my, you know, my company. But has that always worked for you or has that ever backfired? Sure, there's been times. There's been times where, uh, you know, I can say there's a makeup brand that basically was like, Miriam, you, you can't, you know, one of the people that is our brand ambassador doesn't want to work with you because you called her out. And I said, okay, that's completely fine. Um, funny enough, they just reached out to me last week asking me to uh, give in a strategy. <laughs> so, you know, I think they, you know, it's about the work. And again, it's it's about being honest, like I, I don't try to do things for clickbait. I think that's also something that, you know, even I talk to my team about, don't do something because it's trending. You know, don't talk about an issue just because it's what everyone is talking about. You, it needs to come from a place where you really do believe in, in making it better. Um, you know what I mean? Like there's a big difference between constructive criticism and just like online trolling. Um, and I think that people, you know, right now we're, we're on a fine line, especially with what's happening now in the, in the region. 
So your account used to be called Shoes and Drama, and now it's become your official name, and it's a certified account. When did you make that transition, and have you always been the person behind this account? Yeah, so I've always, so Shoes and Drama was always Mary Masali. Like, it wasn't like I was anonymous. So you still knew it was me. My pictures were everywhere. I just like the name, and I still love the name. I kind of want to make it a brand or something. I love it. Um, but I had to do it. I, the only reason I changed it to Mary Masali is so I could be certified. Because when I, I reached out to Instagram and I told them, okay, why am I not certified? They're like, just change it to your real name. You'll get it right away. And literally, I did. <laughs> like, that was it. There was no strategy. It was basically because... Uh, with shoes and drama because of media because they they basically apply you know look at what's uh, being said about you I wasn't being talked about as shoes and drama I was being talked about as Mary Masali business of fashion Mary Masali there was no shoes and drama in there so that was how I was able to to get that and has your team ever supported you in the back end with content like here you guys go just create the content or has it always been you no so my team definitely I have two editors now that work with me on my content um, what they do is they do more of the stories. So if you see that we have like actual, like uh, especially on our Instagram stories, we, you know, we do like multiple slides of a topic. So we'll work together on that. I definitely have, you know, the last kind of, uh, you know, approval. I direct them on what to do. But I mean, it's definitely a collaborative effort. They're the ones, you know, it's hard to have your hand on the pulse, especially like, again, you know, being a mom and a wife and, and an entrepreneur. So I think it is important to have that team and for people to know that there is a team behind there. You know, I always tell, you know, all the all the young girls that come into my office saying they want to be an influencer. I was like, okay, do you know how much time that requires? You know, they have their makeup artists if they're not a beauty blogger. You know, they have their photographer if it's not their their husband. You know, they usually have a whole team um, behind them because it's just kind of like a celebrity doing a TV appearance, except now it's every day on their Snapchat. So, I, you know, for me, I definitely have that support. Um, but I definitely take ownership in terms of what's what's being said. I mean, there has been one or two times where a post goes without me knowing. And I'm like, what is this? And then we have to delete it. But I can't say, oh, that was my team. No, you know, if as the leader, you have to take responsibility for everyone under you. So, Maryam, when I met you, actually, you, you did say, and I was like, how do you, you know, because you started this account 10 years ago. And I was with you, and I think a post went up. And I was like, how are you doing that? You're like, oh, I have a team. And you've always been very transparent that you are getting support so you could also do your meetings and take me out for dinner yeah. and do other yeah, stuff yeah. as well. <laughs> How would you position your account now? It, would you say, is it like a news business, a fashion news channel? Is it like a gossip? Oh, it's a, yeah, so interesting because I think I'm still trying to figure that out. I think that right now the digital landscape has changed so much. You know, like I don't want to be one of these women in, you know, like her 50s that's like, oh, look at me with my Botox on a yacht living the life. Like, you know, it's so weird how there's there's like where's the place for that person in their mid 30s where you still you know I still want to have that engagement but I also don't want to kind of lower myself to clickbait tactics so I, you know it's it's and, and when I say that I just mean a selfie right because that's basically where you get all the likes and, and the views you know I don't want to just post my face everywhere but then I still want to have relevant content but then are people actually even reading online and I think one of the good things that happened during COVID and you know where people got stuck at home and glued to their screens was that they had to read, you know, it wasn't just now about just looking at visuals, but, you know, also absorbing that content. So I think that kind of gave me a re, a, like a sense of um, repurpose now that like, okay, yes, good. I can go back to writing stuff. But I think what my platform is, is that one is that it's a window into Saudi. And I always say this to everyone that's from this region when people don't know about us. And so just by you being online, whether you have like, you know, two followers or, you know, 200,000, you are an ambassador for this region because people are looking at you to see what, you know, Saudi is, what Bahrain's like, what Oman is like. And I think that's really important. And so for me, I've always felt that that's what my platform is. It's a window into Saudi. And one of the things that I'm trying to, to utilize it for is to promote local talents and especially women. I mean, you know, with Under the Abai and stuff, this initiative, this is something that's always been dear to me about us controlling our narratives. I feel for, you know, especially having worked in media, I see it. We don't control narrative. It's written for us. And they just put this picture and this byline and it's like, there you go, this is Saudi. This is not Saudi. And I really think that with social media, we can use that to our benefit. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do. And I'm, I mean, even now recently, we've been on this whole thing about representation now within um, the, the industry and the media industry. It's really sad that the local creatives are not treated with the same respect as, you know, non-Arab um, creatives. And I'm hoping that changes. I'm hoping that we, it's not just going to be a hashtag or a black square that we post, but it's going to be something that really instigates change. And I think companies are watching, you know, even if they're not commenting, they're watching. And I think they're, you know, they're scared, you know, they're, they're going to try to fix themselves up before they become a target for sure. You point out a lot of key issues. You do call out brands 
and you hold them accountable, so truth to power. And I feel, you know, what is the feedback like in the back end? So you're getting the DMs, you're getting the comments, you're seeing, you know, you have this bird's eye view of what's going on. Is it usually supportive? Are you getting a lot of hate mail? What is happening on the backside? I think it's super biased because I always get support. But I mean, you really rarely have people that follow you that don't support you. And if you do have those, you know, those people that come from outside to kind of comment and stuff, I think I, you know, one of the things that I'm very proud of is my ability to communicate with people. Because like I said, I don't shut them off. And you can have a difference of opinion. There have been times where my opinion has changed, really, like, you know, on certain issues where people are like, you know, you're talking about Valentine's Day and da da da. And I'm like, yeah, but it's not religious. But they're like, yeah, but you're giving the wrong message to the youth. And, I, and then I get it. You know, I mean, it takes a while. But as long as I'm having that, that discussion with them, there, there's the potential for them to com- convert me and me to convert them. And I think that's what's so amazing about, you know, a platform like, you know, like Instagram or Twitter or any of these social media platforms is that it is an, a, a way to have a discussion with someone you wouldn't have a discussion with normally. And I think, you know, a lot of times we're preaching to those that are already converted and we need to be preaching to those that, you know, aren't educated or don't understand where we're coming from. And so for me, like I said, I think the DMs, mostly they're, they're really positive and supportive. I mean, even like things like now when we're calling out specific publications, you know, I have all the influencers, the fashionistas and the girls messaging me saying, oh my God, you're so on it that this is correct. You know, maybe they're too afraid because of their careers to speak out. I think that's also something that's, you know, that's uh, different about me is that I feel like no matter what, I will always have a career as long as I'm consistent by being honest. It's when I stop being honest, that one is when it'll backfire on me. But as long as I'm consistent, you know, I, I don't need brand endorsements. I'm not an influencer that does paid ads. So it's not like I'm ruining, you know, myself in that way. Of course, obviously, I still have niche. But I think it's it's the way that I communicate it. Again, it's not about just calling people out. It's about opening the doors and saying, hey, there's an issue here. Let's see how we can fix it. You know, we might not all have the answers either. How did you develop your thick skin? Because to, to do what you do, to like say, you know what? I'm going to do a post about Vogue Arabia. I'm going to hold them accountable. They're not paying... You know, they stole my work. Not only did they not pay. Well, I mean, look, I think that, you know, this is what I try, you know, because I've had girls even ask me this question a lot. Like, oh, my God, ma'am, aren't you scared? Like, you're not going to be in Vogue. And I'm like, that's OK. I'll go in Vogue UK. I'll be in Vogue Italia. You know, I'm on part of the business of fashion list. Their editor is not. And I was like, and that just goes to show you about how you, do, you know, you do, just because one road is blocked or, you know, one avenue, you can open up other ones. And I think, you know, that's what I try to do is that as long as I stay true to myself, good things will happen. You know, your career will survive. You will survive. And, and again, you feel good going to sleep at night. Like, I don't, I don't feel bad going to sleep. I feel like, you know, if I was in Vogue Arabia, I might have some issues with that. But the fact that I know, you know, that I'm, I'm clear conscious about, I'm standing up to that. That needs to be changed. They're, that, they need to be held accountable. So let's say you, you, you're like, you know what? I feel strongly about this. That's ridiculous. You create the post. You post it. You are now in attack mode, right? Like you're ready. People are asking questions. Okay, they're right. fo- that's the difference. I think, I think that's what people assume. And I, actually, and it's funny because even sometimes when I get messages like, thank you so much, it's like these things of like pity, like, oh my God, we're supporting you. Don't worry. I like, I think, you know, you're right when you said that I have thick skin. I don't think of it as attack mode. I think of myself like educational, like I'm a teacher, I'm teaching, I'm schooling you, (laughs) Uh, but not, not attacking. And I think, you know, that thick skin, the, the, how it's developed over the years, and maybe it is because the fact I've been online for, you know, 10 years now is that you realize it's not personal. And, and again, because I've had these conversations where I have converted people where they're like, you know what, thank you for, for reaching out, you know, and, and replying and, you know, giving me the time. Because I think that's all, they just also want to be heard. A lot of these people that are trolling or whatever, they just want their voice to be heard as well. You know, I'll, I'll, I just recently had um, someone that was attacking us for a submission for Under the Abaya. There was a, a photo that wasn't used in the book, but it was part of the submissions. And Grazia had done this beautiful article about just like calling for submissions. So they had used some of them. And one of them was this uh, Saudi girl with... A, uh, an Indian guy, you know, that works in the budded and he's in the background posing and these girls started attacking me saying, I can't believe you're endorsing this, blah, blah, blah. And I, I said, listen, first of all, um, you know, this is not in the book. I'm going to say it right there. And it wasn't actually because of the guy, but it was more because the girl wasn't covered and I didn't like her not being covered in the souk because, you know, I call out Dolce Gabbana and everything when they do those photo shoots where, you know, they have the girls all on, you know, half naked in our, in our, in our souks. But I... But one of the things that I thought was interesting was this girl, instead of letting me first explain, she just kind of went out and just like cussed me out. Okay, it was like a like a whole tirade. And it was like, I'm so angry and I can't believe this. And I just told her, I said, first of all, 
I, I think you should approach the photographer to get more of the, what the, you know, the idea of this thing. You know, I'm happy to connect you with the photographer she, if she allows me. I was like, and second, I really hope that when you speak to her, you speak to her with respect and not attack mode because it'll be a lot easier for her to understand where you're coming from if you're talking to her in a normal, respectful way. The girl was just silent after that, you know, and it, but, it, but it's because like, that's the thing. If you go on the attack mode, you're not going to have what, you know, your, your, your ideas aren't going to be heard. That's for sure. Because they're going to be on defense mode. So I think it's really so why, key. Why don't you try and have a private conversation with some of these brands? Why do you feel like it's necessary to hear followers, thousands of you okay. look at what's happening? So Vogue Arabia, I have emails. I've even talked to their lawyers and everything. So I've done, I've done the, uh, the private, I, but I, again, I think with that's one specific example, Manny, when it comes to brands in general, I think that I'm trying to have a conversation with everyone. So it's not so much that I'm talking directly to the brand. It's more like, what do you guys think? Okay, do you guys agree or not agree? Like I said, I like to in instigate conversation and dialogue. I think that is what I think social media should be used for. So I think by posting these things publicly, that's how you're getting different points of view. And so it's not so much about a direct conversation with the brand. What's crazy, Miriam, is I met people, they love you. They're living their fantasy <laughs> life through you because they want to say these things. They want to have a platform, but, you know, they have private accounts, they have conservative families, or they're just, you know, they feel for whatever reason, you know, so they are getting a kick out of watching you post and then seeing kind of the effects yeah. of that. And then some people are, she's nuts, like she's crazy. So much drama, what a headache. Every day there's a different thing. So my yeah. question is, how do you feel about that? That Because that's such opposite extremes. I think, you know, it's not, it's not for everyone and that's okay. And I think, you know, I've accepted that. And, you know, like I said, I want to be a voice for those people that, like you just said, that either have private accounts or for whatever reason can't speak up. And that's kind of, you know, that's me doing me. If you're not into that, if you're not into this kind of activism is kind of what, you know, I would like to label it, then sure, then follow a, an account that just has a girl wearing her, like, you know, a buyer, her kaftan and cool collars. Good. You know, I, I believe in fashion as escapism. I am totally for that. And there are definitely accounts that I follow just, you know, as my guilty pleasure. And that's okay. But for me, I want it to be more in depth. I want it to have more substance. I don't want to be a billboard. I want there to be, you know, a cause or, you know, something, I mean, just like, you know, what, what you're doing, and I, I love all your initiatives that you're doing, even this podcast, you know, you could have talked about a hundred things. You could talk about branding, advertising. Why talk about women empowerment? Because that's something you felt needed a platform and it needed representation. It's kind of the same thing with me. I feel that I'm sticking up a lot of times for those people that don't have that follower count or whatever, for whatever reason, they can't speak up or they're just scared to. And I, I get it. It is scary. I mean, I don't, I think if I didn't have my support network and I mean that for my team, my friends, my colleagues, I probably would be a lot more timid, but I have that confidence now. Do you regret any of the posts that you've put up? Like, sure. oh, I wish I never did that. You know, one of the things that I, I saw recently that really stuck with me, I'm um, definitely not to the extent of, of blackface, but there's this, uh, this YouTuber, Jenna Marbles, who a lot of people actually say I look like her. I'm the, like the brunette version of uh, Jenna Marbles. But she, she's been online for 10 years. She's one of the original YouTubers. And she's a like humorous um, account, you know, so she makes fun of things. She, she does the makeup tutorial where the makeup goes all over her face. You know, she's one of the first people to do that. Anyway, she recently just um, decided that she was leaving YouTube and she was going to stop producing content because 10 years ago she did a parody of Nicki Minaj, which essentially was in blackface. And back then, you know, it was received well, you know, it had the views, people commented, they thought it was funny, hilarious. And then obviously, you know, 10 years later, we know that that's incorrect. That's not the right way to portray someone of color. And so she, you know, what was interesting about what she was saying was that how she's always kept her content for the, the you know, that old content because she wanted people to see her in her twenties versus her thirties and how she's grown as a person. She thought that was important. But we live in a time now where we're judging people for their past discretions. And I think that's also dangerous instead of seeing them and applauding them for how much they've grown. And I think for me, while I've had things that I regret, I also don't regret them in the fact that I'm happy to see how much I've grown. There are definitely, I mean, look, look me in my 20s, like Susan Drama was, it was a persona as well. You know, you have to understand that. It was like, oh, let's, let's, you know, rip that person apart on the red carpet and then applaud this person. I mean, it was all, it was that tongue in cheek kind of humor. And I think definitely now it's evolved where, okay, I still throw that in. I throw in that little bit of shade, which you can see from my post today with Rogue Arabia, but it, that's just for your entertainment value. But then there's a, that greater message. And I try to make that very clear. You know, it's a fine line between being entertaining and then being informative. And what I try to do is be both. Do you regret anything you've ever said online? I feel I regret it in that, oh my God, that's not me anymore. 
but like regret it to delete it and erase it from my history. Definitely not. I, that makes me who I am. And I want people, I mean, again, like you just said, shoes and drama was completely different than what it is now. And it's just by chance that my names changed too. <laughs> the big, maybe that's just like a maturity thing. Halas, I'm no longer shedding the shoes and drama. And now Mary Masali, you know, so you're a writer, you're a journalist, you use communication as a tool to communicate truth and, and to share your thoughts. Why haven't you joined the IGTV or the Instagram live uh, interviews? Yeah. Why are we not seeing you communicate directly to us and seeing your face and seeing your features? So it's funny you say that because I've actually, when COVID happened, I had a lot of requests and, you know, and I actually took the time when COVID first happened to, to be with my family and to with my team. I felt I was more needed privately than I was publicly. You know, there was a lot of people posting. And one of my even critiques on that in terms of people and brands was that you didn't need to post just to prove that you're alive. Like we get it. Like everyone was kind of in the same situation, but I saw all of a sudden everyone kind of going to this content creation and content creation is not for everyone. You know, I'm not saying don't put, you know, try your hand at it. But what I just mean is that like, we didn't need brands doing lives every single day. You know, they should have just stuck to their regular brand strategy. Um, and the same with individuals. So for me, that was a conscious decision for me not to, to be all over the place. I started doing lives the month before Under the Abaya launched so that I could promote that. And, you know, during that time, it was super interesting because a lot of people were asking me, like, kind of like, you know, about my private life and stuff. And I was always like, but I think I'm so open. But then I realized comparative to other people, I don't show because maybe I'm not on Snapchat. So I don't show like 24 hours of my life. I mean, I feel that I'm an open book. But I guess in this digital time, maybe I'm not like maybe I'm quite conservative. But it's not that I have a fear or anything of, of doing that. It's it's just that I feel it's important to keep, keep some things private. Like, you know, I want to have those times with my son and my family, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. I, I don't need to share everything. Although I do like sharing. Don't get me wrong. And, you know, and again, about like kind of speaking live, I, I don't think I have any issues like speaking, you know, in front of people or anything like that. It's just I didn't feel the need. To, like I had nothing to say. You know what I mean? I, I try to use my platform for things that I think are, are relevant. And for me... You know, I, I felt my post did enough. It wasn't necessary for me to kind of go on live and show you my... In terms of validation, you've mentioned the BOF list, which is a prestigious list. You've been recognized by them. You've moderated a session with John Travolta in Saudi. How does it feel to be validated by these organizations, these institutions, and these celebrities? No, I think it humbles you. I think it really humbles you because you realize that, you know, a lot of times we feel like a small fish in a big, you know, in the big sea, and it's, it's hard, you know? You know, you can get lost on social media. You can get lost in, you know, the, the fashion industry. You know, a lot of times, you know, this is kind of why this, this Arab representation thing is so important to me, because I feel like we're underrepresented when we're actually one of the top consumers. And so, you know, for me, it's just like, it's validation and like, oh my God, they're listening to us. They do care about us. And I think that's super humbling. And when you get it from locally, like from, that's even better. I mean, I always laugh because I always feel like I'm so over the hill when it comes to, you know, the fashion digital industry. So like this new generation probably like, who the hell is this woman? You know, like she's not even fashionable. Why is she here? You know, and I think it's, it's interesting that now I kind of have to reintroduce myself now to the, to the, new, the, to the new generation. Now I know how like the old designers feel when I used to go up to them. But, you know, I think, I think all of these things are, are great. And they, you know, like you said, they'll advance your career and everything. But I think really what it comes down to is just that acknowledgement that what you're doing is correct and you're on the right path. And I think that's what's really great about all of these kind of accolades. Which one was your favorite? Like favorite moment where you were recognized or you were seen? It's actually something that I don't think a lot of people know about because it was during the same time that I got invited to go to the White House to, to meet Michelle Obama. I was the only Arab professional that was invited, which was really great. And my mom was super excited about that. She was telling all her friends. But like a few weeks before that, I actually got invited to go to MIT to speak. And for me, MIT, you know, this kind of prestigious, you know, um, you know, university, that was super cool. And I actually went to speak as an agent of change. And to me, that's like kind of the best label, you know, ever. And for, you know, I'm super humbled by it because that's exactly what I was trying to do is as I was trying to change things. I wanted people to know our stories. I wanted Saudis to, to own that narrative, to show that, you know, we're not just what you see on TV. We have all of these amazing creatives and talent. So for me, being able, being asked to speak at MIT about Saudi, and actually it was really funny, I did a whole lecture on marketing, um, and I talked about the birth of the Black Abaya and how that was basically the first kind of um, trend that came out, and it stuck all, all over these years. So using that as an example. And I mean, to me, that, that meant something, because I felt like it was like validation that what I'm doing is not just you know, promoting myself, but promoting um, an idea that could incite change. 
So when did you start Niche and why did you start it? And what were you really trying to solve? So I started Niche because, I, like I said, I was working at Fashion Weeks, meeting all these designers, and I was basically giving them advice on how to enter the market and really introducing them to the Saudi consumer. Because, you know, the Saudi female consumer was someone behind a black veil. They didn't know anything about her. Um, they just knew that she, she had money to shop, right? That was kind of their idea in their head. So it was really about curating and customizing things for the Saudi female, her 360 needs, whether it was entertainment, fashion, you know, F&B, beauty, whatever it is. I wanted to make sure that things were catered to us because I felt like a lot of times, like even as an editor, I was flying to, you know, Dubai and Dubai, you know, it was still, again, just kind of happening, you know, it's, it's still very Western. When I went to these things, you know, you know this, when we we're there, you didn't see any Emiratis, any coming to these things. And then I'd go to Paris or what, New York for fashion, but no, no one was actually coming to us. And so we, I remember like even trying to go to brands and trying to convince them the first time, let me do this trunk show. And they're like, no, 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 no. And then no, don't do it in Riyadh. You have to do it in Jeddah because Jeddah is more quote unquote open. You know, but I was like, yeah, but the customers are in Riyadh for this. You know, and it, it was just this whole kind of battle with them until finally proof of concept. And then it kind of just opened the doors. And then now we're here at where, you know, we have a trunk show every other day, if not two in one day. So how big so. is your team? So my team is now currently 10. We were 14 and now we're, we're down to 10 because of COVID. You know, we had to kind of cut down. So we did see a reduction on that. And we're based between Jeddah and Riyadh. I remember that you were telling me that you all work remotely. Is that still the case? Or do you have like a home no. base? Do you have an office? So we have an office. We have an office in Jeddah. It's actually walking distance. So it makes me feel very proud that I feel like I'm, you know, no carbon footprint. I like walk to the office. And, and even my team, whenever like there's a new place, like, there's a really nice office. Like it's really cool with the restaurants. I was like, nope, I can walk to mine. <laughs> we're never moving. Sorry, unless I move my house. So yeah, so we, we, we were there in our space um, right by my house. And it's, it's um, I mean, it's nice. I mean, I miss that definitely now during COVID. I feel like I need that to just kind of ground us. Because I'm all about collaboration. So we have brainstorming sessions like twice a day, minimum, you know, and even when we sit, we have our office, but we're all in the conference room, kind of just like, you know, talking and discussing stuff. So what do you spend most of your time doing at Niche? Are you strategizing? Are you doing the sales? I think in the beginning, I'm a micromanager. I have an amazing team and I'm not just saying that because they might watch this or listen to this. Like it really, they're, they're like, I trust them and they, they know the standards. And I think that's, what's important. As long as you have a team that understands the quality and standards, then you're set. And I mean, again, they're all creative. I personally, like you said, like you, I do the business development. So I'm the one that has the meetings, the initial meetings. I think that's also an Arab thing where like, even when I did before, try to send my team out to do these kind of meetings, they still want Maria Masalli. I'm sure you, you dealt with that too. They're, this is like my best person. And like, you know, and actually even with niche, we have people that are focused on jewelry. We have people that are focused on F&B. Like, so they have their, you know, their specialties. And so it's really interesting that, you know, I get asked and they're like, ma'am, we want you to do a digital campaign. I'm, and like, I just told you, I don't know anything about digital. I'm like, I, I don't know what TikTok is. Like, you know, like I'm still on Musical.ly. I don't, I have no idea about these things. And and so it's really funny because I'm like, well, I'm actually not the most qualified on my team, you know, but you rest assured, I'm going to be there. The standards are going to be, you know, the standards that you know of for niche. But yeah, I mean, it, that's been quite a, a transition where I'm definitely all business. I mean, we do have, our, like I said, our collaborative sessions where we brainstorm. So I think on, on the creative side, we're all very uh, much, you know, creative and we put in our input. We at O'Brien Hill have over a decade's worth of experience working with some of the world's most successful brands across F&B, retail, culture, and hospitality. We are equally at home helping a brand define its point of view, positioning a new development, designing product, packaging, or creating content that speaks to an audience. Whatever the challenge, we deliver sharp, intelligent content-driven work that helps brands amplify their message to customers around the world. Contact us on www.obionhill.com or DMing us on Instagram for your public relations, social media, and branding needs. How did you fund your company or your, the startup phase of your company? When so I started my company with about $2,500. Um, one of my first employees, which you know, I shall laugh, is Ala Balki. She was one of my first. So what I did is I, she was my graphic and art. And then I had Dina Esmail was an amazing at the time. I mean, she, she's a, she was a writer that I poached from Destination Jeddah. And I mean, just an amazing account manager. And then I hired the only five fashion bloggers that were active in Jeddah. 
and I had them on my payroll. Um, this was my strategy of like, now everything that's going on is going to be published because I don't like, I, they work for me. Right. So it, this was kind of what I did. And I, you know, I started off and every project we got, the money went back in. As you said, I didn't pay myself. I was lucky enough where, you know, my home was paid for by my parents. I was still living at home. So I didn't have to pay rent or anything like that. And yeah, and I just reinvested it back. And alhamdulillah, I have to say over the past 10 years, there's not been one time where niche has been in the, in the red. So we've always been profitable. Uh, you know, our first clients, I mean, and this is where I think a lot of luck and being, you know, having that voice out really helped. My first client was Burberry, Christian Labatan, and Harvey Nichols Riyadh. So right from the get-go, we started with really strong name brands. And that, of course, you know, made us get more and more and more and kind of snowballed. So alhamdulillah, we started off on a really strong foot. So are you paying yourself a salary now? Yes, I do pay myself a salary now. I think one is that you need to know your value. You know, like, look, I'm all for the whole, like, hustle of, of being an entrepreneur. And like you said, you know, there are going to be those, like, five years or whatever where you say, I'm, I'm going to not take a salary. I'm going to invest it back in my company. But you should have a timeline. You should have something where you say, okay, by at this point, if I'm not paying myself, then I need to figure out something else or another revenue stream because you will burn out. If you're not getting the satisfaction of, you know, being compensated, and I mean, I'm not even just talking financially, but just whatever, you know, whatever you're doing in life, then it, you're going to get burnt out. I mean, your passion has to be fed somehow. And, and you know, for me, it is, you know, like whether it's like getting accolades, whether it's being recognized, whether it's, it's financial, there needs to be something that kind of gives you that path or else you're going to burn out. It's just common sense, I feel. What is your relationship like with money? So I'm the type, since I was a kid, I would save my money throughout the whole year, no joke. And I remember like I would go to, to you know, travel because that's what, you know, we did. We'd go travel and buy a whole new wardrobe. And so, you know, I, I would like literally be the cheapest person for, you know, eight months out of the year. And then on four months, I was a baller. <laughs> I'd go to Hot Topic and buy, I remember the, back in the day, it was $60 jeans, which was like unheard of. Like, you know, even my, my, my parents would be like, who buys $60 denim? I'm like, I do. So I think, you know, my relation with money is quite the same. I, I like nice things. So I do save, but I earn it. Like, I mean, you can ask my husband, I've always been like that. If I want something, I will get it. I don't need to ask someone for it. And that to me is I think that's where I, maybe I, I, I live off. I like the fact that I, I buy my own stuff. That means something to me. You know, I remember, I'll never forget, when I was a kid, I walked into my mom having an adult conversation with one of, what, like an aunt or something, uh, some relative, and she, they were talking about divorce. And, you know, the, the woman was saying, she was basically like, you know, what, but how would I get divorced? I have no, you know, no money. I have no plans. And my mom was like, well, you know, you went to university, you could start teaching or something. And she's like, I haven't, you know, done this. I haven't, and she hasn't worked in whatever, 20 years. So she's like, how am I just going to all of a sudden enter the job market? And I remember I must've been like 13 at the time. And that really stuck with me. Cause I was like, this woman is like kind of trapped because she's financially isn't independent. And I remember thinking like, that's never going to be me. For example, one of the things I, I got asked to was part of this um, a program with Ithra. So it was this like ambassadorship program where they were selecting various Saudis, whether you're a film director, architect, I mean, various industries to go to the States and kind of speak and introduce people to Saudis. And they asked me as an entrepreneur. And one of the things that I did was I took 12 women, and that's actually how Under the Bio got started. I took 12 fashion designers and did a, a, a mini film that I wrote this monologue and it's basically about them becoming more financially independent, about how fashion has become an outlet for these women to be financially, you know, independent, to be, you know, secure, confident. And, you know, one of the lines in that in that monologue is like, you know, with every stitch, you know, she's more, she's stronger with, you know, with every invoice, you know, she gets more independent. And I think, you know, th that's kind of where, you know, as, a, as an entrepreneur, I felt that was really important to me that I wanted to have that independence. You know, my parents kind of armed me with an education and was like, thank you. You know, that's it. <laughs> that's all you get from us. I mean, definitely valuable. Definitely. You know, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for them. But financially, it was up to me to kind of make my way. And alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm really happy that now I can support a team of 10 and, and have a company that's, you know, over 10 years old. When you recruit, I don't know about you, but working with locals can be challenging. It, there are different types of people, but there is a group of women who are entitled or who don't have the work ethic that maybe you or I might have. Have you worked with those types of women? How do you deal with it? Have you found it easy to, to assemble your team? No, definitely. That's taken 10 years <laughs> for sure, you know, to, to get to my team to where it is now. You know, I, I have like Iana, for example, is kind of the oldest employee. She's been with me since year two. So about eight years. It's my number two. I, you know, without her, there's no niche. Um, I always tell her that. 
And funny enough, when I was thanking everyone on our team for the Under the Bio launch, she was the one name I forgot. <laughs> I was like, I feel so bad. But, you know, that tends to happen when, when you know, she's, again, she's my number two. But I think, you know, what it comes down to, you know, you have to remember, I remember people like our mom's generation, it was weird for a woman to work. And it was kind of looked down upon like, oh, your mom works. It was like a negative. Whereas now I think it's like a positive. Oh, your mom works. It's there's a like, it's cool. She's progressive. And I mean, that's something that I think with society, you know, I felt that that shift. That being said, when I first started niche, I would say I had this issue a lot more where I would have girls come in and like, they're like all, you know, head to toe, dressed up, Hermes bag, lipstick on. And I would be like, on purpose, you know, the way that I look, I'd be like, hey, you see me? This is how you're going to look. No, you know, hair undone, no, no makeup, wearing flats, because that's what this job requires. We are the behind the scenes of everything that you're seeing on social media. We're doing the contracts, we're doing the vendors, we're doing, you know, the production, you know, all of this, blah, blah, the, the, like the, you know, very similar industries. And, and for me, I, I wanted to make those expectations very clear to them from the beginning. So, you know, we, we, we see those girls, but a lot of times they don't make it through, you know, the second interview. Um, and one of the things, again, that I always tell people is that, you don't you know, again, niche has kind of been hand in hand with fashion, especially because of me. But we do way more than that. You know, we're a very um, diverse company. We work in automotives. We work in hospitality, FNB. So for me, it's really important that they understand that this is a marketing job and not a fashion job. I think, you know, so it's, it's really important to get that, you know, from the, the get go, like what are the expectations that they have and making sure that they're aligned to what we actually do. But, in, you know, going back into this thing about the self and uh, this idea of self entitlement, this has definitely been an issue that I used to speak up at the universities here in Saudi. And I was telling girls, I was like, you know, because of Saudiization, you guys think you guys just have this in the bag because there's not that many, you know, Saudi women doing this or that. Now there is. And this is one of the things that I even tell women today. Um, I think even at the panel, when I was speaking at the Women Empowerment Forum, I was saying that it's not about being the first, it's about being the best now. We've had, you know, those people kind of breaking the, you know, the ground in terms of like, you know, the first uh, female psychiatrist, the first fashion stylist. Okay, great. But now we're competing on a global level. So let's try to aim to be, you know, the best in our field and not just the first. And I think that's something that is very new for, especially specifically for Saudi. And I think that's something that this this next generation understands because the quality of people I'm seeing now versus what I saw 10 years ago, it's like, you know, black and white. These girls are intelligent. They're driven. They understand hard work. I, I mean, I'm really excited to see this, this next wave of women. Have you ever had to terminate a client or have you ever had a client not be happy with one of your services? Oh my God, yes. Oh my God, yes. I remember th the first time this happened because, you know, you're going on a high where you're like, dude, to do it, you're killing it, you're killing it. And it was probably like two to two and a half years into my, into, you know, niche. And I had, and this one was actually, it's a traumatic story because it was one of my mentors and she, she was a jewelry designer. She's one of the reasons why I started niche. You know, she was the one that gave me this advice and I really loved her because I felt she was a, you know, self-made woman, even though her husband's like this multi-billionaire out of New York. But, you know, she was all about doing everything, very hands-on, you know, let's say in her work. And she came to Saudi and there was actually a, a funeral from, uh, from, you know, one of the else who had passed away. And so this kind of canceled our event. It was like a jewelry trunk show for them. And she did not take that well. And she was not happy. And I just remember having to, you know, deal with those expectations and manage them. And I mean, again, there was no, no fault to anyone, but we tried to kind of compensate it by inviting other people. Didn't work as well. And for me, I was really hard on myself, but I think more so it was because of who she was and what she meant to me. There was that personal aspect to it that really, I mean, it depressed me. Like I went into a full on depression. I think I didn't, like I told my team, you're dealing with everything else. I'm taking two, three weeks off. Like I've never done that. I would never just leave my company, but it was just like, I needed to reset. And it was only like after that where I was like, you know what? Things happen. You just need to make sure that the client is satisfied. What else do you need? You know, we took her to Dubai then. We did her strategy, what she wanted. You know what I mean? I did everything. I even like, you know, um, didn't charge her for our services. It was only just for the, like the flight in the hotel. You know, I, I think, you know, one of the things that I, I was raised and maybe this is the American side of me is that the customer is always right. Right. You know, and if I'm providing a service, client satisfaction is everything. So even when we don't do things like up to standard, we make sure that we, we, you know, keep working at it until they're satisfied.
I want to give you some advice. It's something that I learned. You need to manage their expectations. And when I say that, it's not like, oh yeah, you know, like telling them, oh, instead of, you know, a hundred women will get 50. No, I mean like even in terms of saying your strategy is incorrect. You need like one of the things that I, I, I always laugh. I remember seeing, you know, working in branding company when all of my friends that were, you know, or my colleagues that were art directors and graphic and they would get so upset because the client wants them to do their idea, but them execute it, you know, and they're like, but I'm the creative, not them. And, you know, the client just wants me to do the tech side, you know, the technical side of it. One of the things that I, I saw is that that was kind of similar to what was happening to me i would get these companies you know most of them based in dubai as you know the middle eastern offices are based in dubai so the person is in their dubai bubble they come over and they're like hey so we want you to do the same thing we're doing in dubai i'm like darling first of all we don't have paparazzi here we don't have the celebrities we don't have the alcohol we don't have you know there's like you can't copy paste something that's working in dubai and say it's going to work in saudi and i was like you're hiring me because i'm local and i know the way that this you know society works and how marketing should be so either you're going to listen to me you know, or not. And I think, you know, th- that was, our, that came kind of middle in my career because it wasn't until I had the confidence to kind of say that. And, and you really, you have to have the confidence that they might walk away. And by the way, they have walked away. I've had clients that said, okay, Miriam, then bye. You know, we want someone that's good. Go ahead. Guess what? So, well, well, I swear to God, this two times that client came back a year later to me, like two different clients have come back saying, okay, we're ready. And I'm like, guess what? It's went up the price. <laughs> like, you know, like we had to add a little, you know, little inflation there, but you know, and I really do think because you, you have to stick to your guys, but again, you have to be confident in what you know. And I think, you know, someone like you, you know, you know, Bahrain, you know, you're, you know, the East coast, you, this is why they're hiring you. I think, and again, this goes into that whole kind of idea of this like European um, yeah, point of view. It's like, well, we know better because we're part of the brand. Yeah, but you're the brand trying to customize it for us. You're trying to assimilate to our our country and we're giving you that advice. You know, don't, I, I've had so many instances, especially like, for example, with like brand uh, ambassadors where a brand will say, we want to use this girl because, you know, she looks very, even her, her Instagram looks very Western. You know, they don't want to use the, the influencer that doesn't show her face. That's only posting products. I'm like, yeah, but that person that's only posting products has, you know, um, you know, 300,000 of those people are your top VIPs. Like, what are you doing? You know, whereas that other girl is very masked because she shows herself, you know, and, and I, I, I can explain to you why I'm giving you this advice, you know, but you need to listen. When did you start under the Abaya and is this like your new baby? I don't think it's a reflection of my creativity because it's definitely everyone else's creativity <laughs> that's doing it. I think it's more of a reflection of my growth. I think that, you know, actually I was saying this at your summit when I was like, the most important thing is that what I've learned is that my 20s were about my ego, right? It was like gathering up all of these accolades and like, okay, great, Mary, I'm like getting that, that pat on the back, you're doing right. Whereas now that I'm in my 30s, I feel like what I get kind of the high on is is helping the next generation. I like, you know, and maybe it's because my mom and my sister and my stepmom are all in education that I have that kind of, you know, um, educational aspect or, uh, to it. But I, I just feel that this is the time where, you know, as I said, what's the point in my career if it's not to lead the way for the next generation? And I, and I really do believe that. And for me, under the bio... I mean, it was something that happened just so organically. I, I had to do a book for the Jeddah Art Book Fair. I had this idea in my head that I was toying with, but I never kind of did anything about it. And so with that deadline, I ended up posting. And within a week, we had a th- you know over a thousand submissions. That book, the first edition was created in two weeks. And we called it the first edition because I knew that that was definitely not going to be the final edition because, again, only two weeks. And then this one we spent a year doing. Giving back, I think, is is it makes you feel good. You know what I mean? It does. It really, I mean, I know it sounds so selfish, but it's true. Like, I mean, the first edition, we were able to give five uh, scholarships for photography this year. We're aiming for more. My, my goal for under the bias to create a foundation and make it have branches where it becomes a resource, a platform for, for women, you know, free advice, free workshops. I want to do a children's book line where we talk about, you know, the, the like kind of like little uh, people, um, was it little people, big dreams where we've picked like 10 women from the region and we kind of, you know, do that for the youth. So, I mean, I, I do see it, I mean, putting more time in that as I get older, but I think it's only just because that's where I, I see, that's where I feel, you know, happy about this is, this is where I see the return on all my efforts. We did this, um, this, uh, event. It was the first ever female public, uh, sports day in Saudi and it was 10,000 girls showed up. And I have to tell you, what, I was like almost on the verge of tears throughout the two hours. It's probably cause I didn't sleep for three days. Right. But it was also the fact that seeing these young girls telling me thank you for doing a sports day because they don't have access to you know physical education 
to me was crazy. You know, I, 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 it's something that I, I can't relate to because I've always had those opportunities. And when you see that, and when you see that your work is, is affecting people in that way, it's very hard to go back to kind of doing superficial, like opening star openings, <laughs> like to be honest. So is under the Abaya self published? Is it published yeah. by a publishing company? So the first one was published by um, Khalud Atar Publishing. Um, it's CAF, uh, K-A-P-H. And she, so we did that with the first issue was with her. And then the second one, we decided to self-publish. Because the publishing industry here in the Middle East, is it's very different than everywhere else. Usually you pay the publisher and not the publisher pays you. And then they, you take a commission from your work, not the other way around. So the, you pay the publisher first, a fee to do it. And then once your book gets published, you take a commission, not them taking a commission. And so what we did is we worked with the Ministry of Media, the United you know, Saudi, which has been super supportive. Um, you know, they gave us the ISBN. I'm publishing it with some great printers that we work with here. And um, yeah, we did it ourselves. I mean, the art direction was, you know, Yasmin Hayat from our, you know, just amazing art director. And then, you know, my team were the girls behind it. I mean, even Shahad, who was in charge of all the submissions, she actively went out and reached out to 150 women that she was like, these are cool women. Um, and I mean, so we have everyone. From- so are you also saying that this is a, a non for profit project or are you also, yes. you know, generating profit from it? 100% nonprofit. So all of the money, yes, all of the money goes to, I know my husband's like, you're an idiot. <laughs> okay. So all the money goes to, to put it for these scholarships. And because to me, that's what, why it's important. It's women supporting women. And the moment you make any a profit, I feel like then it's going to be like, oh, it's Miriam. It's not about me. This book is not about me. This is why even in the interviews, it's like, great guys, I'll speak about the book for five minutes, but then here's, you know, this girl, this girl, this girl, interview them. Like we want to give them the platform. And, you know, we, we were super lucky. The first edition, we had Cadillac that came on that was supporting us because they're all about this, uh, what is it, um, Dare Boldly was their slogan. And for Lux, what was great is that I worked with an all-female team from their side. And their whole thing is about women empowerment. They have this concept with Miras, which is a platform where they do the SEO for women. So, for example, if I'm looking for a female fashion photographer comes up first. So we thought that they were super aligned with what we were doing and we wanted to, to collaborate together. So they actually powered our, our event, which was going to be a physical event. We were looking at having Yasmin Sabri, who's their brand ambassador, come. You know, we had everything planned. And then, of course, COVID came and, you know, ruined everything. Um, but then in that way, we were able to pivot. And then we did this like first digital um, book launch, which was super cool. I mean, the speakers were just amazing. And I think also the fact that people had been, you know, dealing with live sessions for the past three months really got them prepared for this launch because it was super engaged. I mean, I don't know if you know, but like we had 200 women over the two hours, like the numbers stayed, like no one left. Like I was like surprised. I was like, you know, no one, I, you know, no one's going to go like, you know, kind of check out. Okay. I saw the one speaker. No, they were super engaged throughout the whole thing, which I mean, I, I think just goes to show how, you know, these like, I mean, even now with this podcast, women want to hear other women speak. This is what's real. This is what's relatable. I wanted to ask you was one, how has marriage changed you? And then I want to talk about Saud. So let's first do, let's do the marriage question first. I think marriage has taught me to, well, I, I think, I think in general, like it's definitely made me compromise more. And I'm not saying that in a negative way, because I think a lot of times pr- compromise has this negative connotation to it. And I, I don't think that's it. I think, you know, he's, he's balanced me out just because there's another person in the equation. I mean, you know, I always tell my team, you know, we we're, our team, by the way, has always been an all-female team. We always have one token guy, though, in there that we love. You know, it's been Abdullah before that. I mean, uh, after that, Ibrahim, and then after that, Faisal. But um, one of the things that I always tell the girls is that you need to be ready to have someone else come in and make decisions with you because that's what marriage is. It's two people now creating, you know, having their input on something. You know, I'll never forget when my sister, I saw my sister one time, you know, we were, I wanted to go to London and I was like, no, well, let's go to London with mom and we can make it a cute like girls trip. And she's like, hey, let me ask my husband. I was like, what? Ask your husband? I mean, I I must've been like 15 at the time. I was like, what do you mean ask your husband? Like, who are you? And then she's like, "Uh, you know, we have three kids, Miriam. Like, you know, we got to coordinate schedules or whatever. But I mean, to me, that was just so like, like against my whole thing of women empowerment and stuff. And now that I'm being married, I'm like, oh my God, I definitely asked my husband. It's not because he gives me permission, but it's because it's his, you know, he, he, it affects him as well, whether I'm traveling or or doing something, you know. And I think it's also just valuing the person enough. Like I care enough about you to just let you know if, if you're on board with this and if it's not going to cause any issues or if it's not going to disrupt your schedule. So it's just being thoughtful. Exactly. No, and not like that. I mean, and uh, I mean, I hate to admit it and I'll never admit this to him publicly, but he is like, he's usually right about things, you know, like 
I hate to say it. I think, you know, he gives, he gives a different um, perspective that sometimes I don't see because, you know, I'm so into it or, you know, going too fast. And I like that, that he allows me to kind of pause and see things from a different side. So I think for, for marriage, it's definitely, I mean, I guess it's taught me not that I'm not always right. And that like, you know, it's, it's okay to have someone else's opinion. It doesn't make you weaker. In fact, it makes me stronger. The fact that I have like two brains attacking something versus just mine. I've seen you recently launch an Instagram account for Saud, your son. And I was telling my husband, I told you so because I really wanted to do one for safe. Um, and I love this idea of, of brand building at such a young age. That means when he gets older, he's going to have all this content, maybe some money that you're going to have put aside for him from all his brand endorsements. And it's yeah. just giving him a leg up over all his students. And, and my husband's like, no, like, what if he doesn't want? Why don't you ask him? What if he's like, you know, mom, I don't want to do this. Like, how, why are you deciding for him? So there's two sides of the argument. I think we're all brands and the sooner we start, the better. But can you tell me more about... Have you been getting beef about this and, and what's the intention behind it? So it was really interesting because I actually didn't show him when I first was born because, and again, that's like an Arab thing you know, where they don't show the face and all that. And so from my side, my, you know, my mom's side of the family, it was like, where are his pictures? Where are his pictures? And I actually posted and asked people on my team, like, what do you guys think? Like, should I, you know, I'm asking all the new moms, like, what, what is the kind of protocol on this? And it was really interesting to see it was completely all over the place. Like some people are totally for it. Some people are totally against it. Some people are like, you know, do what you feel, girl, that kind of thing. And for me, I mean, my husband is just like your husband. He's like, what are you doing? He's too young. He doesn't know, you know, anything. You should give him a choice. And for me, what I've done is that I feel like how I'm honest and how I post about my life, that's what I'm going to do. And now that suits in it, there's no difference. It's just so, you know, instead of you getting me going to the salon, sometimes you're going to get me, play, you know, getting spit up on me from Saud or whatever it is. Um, so in that regard, I feel like I'm still consistent in terms of what I'm showing people. Um, but I, I mean, no joke. I was just telling my husband this. I was like, listen, you know, I make jokes that I'm the Chris Jenner and I'm going to totally brand endorse him. But the, the truth is, is that, you know, I, I do believe that, that now all the professions that we're thinking about, like, oh, he's going to be, you know, an astronaut or he's going to be this or a race car driver. It's all going to be digital. I don't think those careers you know, might even, you know, exist, some of these. So for me, it's like, what, yeah, let him have that leg up. Let him have, you know, these, these followers so that if he does want to open a restaurant, or if he does want to start a business, he already has that. And I'm not saying I'm going to be filming him throughout, you know, his, you know, puberty and everything. I'm definitely going to give him, you know, a chance, but I, yeah, for me, it's that I'm showing him through my eyes and, and that's it. I mean, that, that account that I have for him is, is his private account. And I kind of just did that for friends and family, just if they want to kind of catch up and see more of Saoud's. Has being a mom changed you at all? At all? Oh, definitely. My friends all laugh because now I'm like a softie when I watch movies. Anything that has a kid in it, I just bawl. And I, I used to be like the cold robot watching any movie because I'd be like, that's a fake. That's so fake. And now anything with kids, you'll catch me crying. So I'm definitely more soft. I, I definitely, you know, one of the things that, you know, even with social media, we were talking about digital footprints was that, you know, I realized that my son is probably going to grow up and see my Instagram. What is he going to think about all these posts? You know, how is he going to be like, God, mom, you're such a weirdo. Like, oh my God, you're so dramatic. You know, like I, I'm just waiting for it. So I feel like it's also got me to be a bit more cautious of what I'm putting out in the world because I realize now that this will not just affect me, but also him. Do you ever have mom guilt or does anybody ever shame you or like mommy shame you? Like you're working too hard and why don't you relax? And are you present with him or are you always like working on the laptop and just kind of well, I am very, very present. Um, he comes to uh, with us to the office. I, I, I was blessed with a very calm, uh, quiet baby. So like even when like he was uh, like a newborn, he was coming with me to the office, sitting with the team. And so he's been like really ingrained. Like he's going to be a CEO of this kid. <laughs> he sees it. I want him to see that. Um, you know, and like I said, I think that, you know, before when I was in the office, the moment I come home to the moment he's asleep, I'm with him. Like, you know, because I probably that is the mom guilt there. Like, OK, now that I've been gone, I need to be with him. Um, and now that, you know, with COVID and working from home, it's, um, I mean, the only reason he didn't just jump into this, uh, this call is because he's napping right now. Um, but otherwise he'd be everywhere. Yeah. He'd be like, oh. I mean, and it happened. You should see some of these lives. Actually, funny enough, I was giving a live and I was like, you know, I keep getting asked about like my kid and being a mom. And I was like, you know, we talk about, you know, women empowerment, but like, if you're a man, you're not really asked these questions, you know, I was like, but I'm not saying it's wrong because that is an important thing, right? It is the thing that like, cause now I also am dealing with a kid and a husband. And as I'm saying all of this, all of a sudden, mom, 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 like just start screaming. And I was like, you know, I'm like pretending I have it all together. And then this kid is just ruining it, ruining everything. And then the girl's like, okay, sure. The reason we ask these questions is because of this. <laughs> you don't have it together. <laughs> 
Are you at the point where your company is serving you or, or is it still dependent on you to get business and to function? No, 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 no. And it's, it's funny because we'll find, like you said, you know, we're both, uh, you know, uh, micromanagers and really hands on. So the way that I did it is I tested it. It was happening in summer. I would relocate for summer for about three to four months. And obviously that's not like, I'm still working from there, but in terms of like on the ground management events and stuff for two months, my team would have it. And I'm telling you, my, my team goes out and gets clients that I wouldn't be able to get. I'm just saying, like, you know, like I came back one time, they're like, oh, we have Chanel, uh, you know, makeup, we have this. I'm like, ah, when did you have these meetings? You know, like, so I think, you know, it's, it, it is, it's really encouraging to, to them as well when you give them that leeway, because I feel like that makes them step up. You know, they, they, they feel confident when you show them that you're confident in them. And so alhamdulillah, like I, I'm, like I said, I'm really blessed to have a team that takes that initiative it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy finding these people. It did take time. You know, that, you know, it's, it's difficult, especially when you have like an all girls team, you know, you have one bad apple and that can poison everything. And that's one thing that I've really noticed. I learned that, you know, a few years ago, we had a girl that was just so negative about everything. And I was like, you know what? It's just, I'm so sorry. It's not a right fit. I was like, and it was not like she did anything wrong with work. It was just the attitude and stuff. And it, it, you feel it, it gets. And so when you have these women that support each other and encourage each other, you really feel it. And I think that's the winning like formula that I have with my team right now is that they're super supportive with each other. What's the big plan? So 10 years from now? Uh, no, I actually, you know, for Nisha, I've never thought of it being like, you know, international. I've actually had some, uh, some people come and ask to, to franchise it. And I mean, that was never the thing, because again, I feel like it's, it's my baby and I, I want those standards. I want to even with my team, you know, make sure that it, it, it keeps that name. I think the more, you know, that you expand, it, uh, it'll dilute the brand. So I didn't want to do that. I think for me, it's always going to be about doing other projects. Like right now I'm working, well, I'm discussing and brainstorming with a few partners, um, some uh, tech startups, because I think that, you know, that is the future. One is in fashion, one is in wellness. But I, I mean, I think for, you know, for Nisha, it being a consultancy and the way that it's kind of, uh, you know, structured is that I'm able to do these passion projects. So the growth would probably be not within, you know, within Nisha, but not niche itself, if that makes sense. It'd be the projects. Okay. And for Under the Abaya, I definitely see myself focusing more on that. Um, I want to make it a, a, a foundation where we can, you know, offer scholarships, even just give free resources. Um, but again, I want this to be something that it's all about like women coming in and, and volunteering and supporting because again, that's the whole kind of premise is that it's women supporting women. Um, no one gets anything out of it except support for each other. When you said tech startups, you mean like coming in as an investor or a partner? No, like tech startups, like I'm actually creating it. So I'm actually a partner and then I would be getting more investors. Yeah, no, it's like, it's just, I mean, one of them is kind of like a rent the runway kind of concept, but just looking at a different segment that I think is completely neglected in the market. And the other one is basically kind of like your Saudi goop that I want to create because it's more about community. And also one of the things that I noticed is that with all the fitness instructors and wellness instructors, yoga and whatever, they're having such an issue now, even post you know, lockdown where people are still you know, unsure about going and attending these group things. So I feel like they all need a, a, like a platform where they can give these classes and it not be Zoom or, or um, Instagram Live. And instead of them all investing in an app, might as well create one platform that they can all come together. So this is, yeah, these are my, my, my pet projects. This is what, what I've been doing during COVID, working on this. And actually, wait, one of the things that I completely forgot about that I've actually been working on before COVID that's coming out that I just announced is Saudi Style Council. So we're working on, on that as a, as a um, it's basically a free um, resource for people. You can download like contracts, freelance contracts. Um, it's a directory. It's networking. I think of it as LinkedIn for creatives um, that I'm trying to create out of, out, of the, out of Saudi. And then are you creating it and then pitching it to potential partners to fund it? So I'm already t in talks with the Ministry of Culture. So we're, yeah, government endorsement is great. I mean, they're, I mean, that's all we need, basically, because I've, I've basically got a bunch of creatives together already. We've been, again, I've said, like, we've been working on this for a few months. Um, and then we have, obviously, our strategic partners that, you know, we're, we're engaging with. Um, you know, we want to bring on business of fashion. We want to bring the CFDA. Um, but the idea here is just to kind of, give people a reference point because our, our creative ecosystem is brand new. You know what I mean? Like I get all those questions all the time. Like, Hey Miriam, I'm an up and coming creative director, up and coming stylist. How much should I charge? You know, we don't have a reference point because it is a new, a green industry. So I think, um, you know, this was why I saw this need. And, and for me, it's not about a title. It's not about you're the head of the council. This person's on this council. No, it is very inclusive. It, again, it's, it's a free resource. I mean, we could have paid like, um, mentorship programs or something like that. 
But obviously with that, we're going to try to get sponsors or the government to, to endorse that. I feel so vibrant and, and alive <laughs> and you're such a energy force. So I want to thank you for your work and for just hustling every day and pushing the envelope. And I follow you and I champion you and I really wish you the very best. You're always on my mind and you're always on my phone. That's it for this week. Thank you for listening to an episode of the Women Power Podcast. And thank you for downloading and streaming our podcast every week. If you love what you've heard, tag us on Instagram and follow the Women Power Podcast and the Women Power Summit account for more information on our next episode. Please leave a rating review wherever you get your podcast. It really helps other women discover the show. That's it from me. See you next week. Thank you.